The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. All right, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Zach Underwood. He's got a whole bunch of letters behind his name, like RHCE and various others. I don't see uh, A plus though. No, I do not. <laughs> he's a sysadmin with Global Vision, uh, a wireless ISP, and he's here to talk about setting up the uh, wireless access here at Self. Well, thank you for that intro. Um, before I get started, I do want to give one thanks. Um, Bo, if you'd stand up. Yeah, stand up, Bo. Um, <laughs> Bo Sanders was my Linux teacher while I was um, at college, and he's um, mentored me to steer me towards this path, so I just wanted to give that shout out, and, and I did not warn him, so that was a bit of a surprise for him. Um, my background. Um, pr prior to going to my current company, I was basically the average sysadmin when it came to wireless. Hey, I'll go buy this Linksys router, I'll plug it in, and hey, it kind of works. Um, then I went work for a wireless ISP, where I do everything from climb cell phone towers to install antennas to program routers for BGP. Um, so this is a little bit about uh, my background. I am an RHCE for version 6. Um, my company sets up and maintains um, large-scale Wi-Fi systems for um, cities, um, the landmark um, or the CBRE slash Furman Company management company buildings. So these are high rises, 20, 30 stories, where we provide Wi-Fi throughout the building. We also do um, quite a few outdoor installations with cities, uh, where we would put up access points on main streets and then um, feed those access points using wireless technology so that we don't have to run as many cables. And if I am talking too fast, someone please say something, because I'll get that way. Um, they, um, we have done Pickens, South Carolina. Um, we also have put in bids to do um, Easley, South Carolina, Liberty, South Carolina, and Anderson County, or Anderson City. The question was, what cities have we provided um, Wi-Fi to? And our Pickens network can see about a thousand unique users um, a week. Um, concurrently, it's only about a hundred, but. Being that these access points are mounted at street level, we get a lot of, um, as people are driving down Main Street, their cell phones auto-connect, uh, whether they know it or not. And so we do have your, we do have your MAC address. A um, little Wi-Fi intro um, and some misconceptions about Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a two-way conversation. It is not like FM and AM radio. It is not one way. So. That means that your client, the client device, has to be strong enough to talk back to the access point. Um, the best analog I can give would be if, say, I'm an access point and one of y'all are a client. I'm standing up here with a PA system. You're back there whispering. We cannot have a two-way conversation doing that. So when you spec out antennas for a wireless system, you have to, you cannot go, ooh, this has a huge antenna. It's gonna give me great range. That's not gonna do me any good if your clients can't talk back to the access point. Um, signal versus noise. Um, this gets, a, any, any of y'all hands? Good, so y'all know about signal versus noise ratios. Um, for those who are not hands, signal is basically the signal that it receives from the access point or the client, depending on which direction you're going. The noise is how much other frequency in the area is being used. The best analog I could come up with would be the equivalent of noise would be like a car outside playing loud music. I, I'm the signal. There, I have to speak louder to overcome the car stereo outside in order for y'all to hear me. Um, so if you could lower the noise, like turn the car off, the, or closing the door, then you can then, the requirement for the signal level goes down. So the quieter you can get the environment, noise-wise um, and RF-wise, the better the performance. 
Um, a, B, and G are different wireless standards. Um, I, every, all of that is considered legacy, and if you're still running an access point that is one of those three standards, please turn it off. It is a waste of spectrum. Um, spend 50, 60 bucks and get a wireless in. So, for the same amount of um, spectrum, you can get double, triple the performance. Um, and then we're up to what we have currently, which is um, wireless N and wireless AC. Um, AC is really new. Um, devices just started shipping in the past year. Client devices that I know of are high-end um, Android phones, like the Galaxy S4 and the uh, Nexus 5, um, MacBook Pros, but I, I don't think MacBook Air, the MacBook Airs have it. I think it's just the Pros. And also, um, I saw a Samsung device here that had um, wireless AC too. Um, wireless N is in the majority of the devices that connect to the network. I would say, looking at the statistics, about 98% of the devices connect to the network are wireless N. Okay, 2.4 versus uh, 5 gigahertz. Um, 2.4 has a lot more noise. Um, that noise can come anywhere from microwaves to cell phones to uh, these wireless mics. I uh, really hope this ain't 2.4. Um, one of the hardest things that can be to troubleshoot a 2.4 network is you can get a call in from your users going, hey, starting at about 11 o'clock, Wi-Fi just sucks. And then you start investigating it, you start getting a, a spectrum analyzer, and then you start seeing spikes and the noise. It's around 11.30. People go to lunch during 11.30. Microwaves, people will be turned, certain microwaves, when they are activated, produce the same frequency as wireless uh, 2.4. So that, they can cause a lot of interference. Um, 2.4, uh, because it's legacy, um, has better support among clients. Every, wi every wireless client is 2.4. Not every wireless client is 5. Um, 5 gigahertz is better in most all, all aspects with one exception. It's got more spectrum and better speed. And it's cleaner spectrum. Because um, its negative is its penetration through materials is not as great as 2.4. So it takes a lot more access points to cover 5. That can be a blessing and a curse. Yes, it costs more money, but it gets more access points. So the more access points, the more bandwidth that you can push because the more clients can associate. Um, in 2.4, there's only three overlapping channels. It's 1, 6, uh, one, six and 11. Um, and that does leave a small buffer between them. Um, and I can actually show you what those look like. And um, this is my favorite program called Insider. And what you essentially see here is the 1, 6, and 11 channels. Um, and the, you can see there's a nice little buffer between 8 and 9. Um, and whoever is running, the, whoever runs their access point, BizOps, uh, MiFi, whoever runs their access points on, on non-standard channels screws everyone. Because what happens, What happens, see what happens when I highlighted this? It, um, it turned all of these red. What is happening by this one guy? Um, my, the Verizon MiFi's are notorious for doing this. Um, what happens is that, free, that channel is now squashing and causing problems on two of my channels, where if it just moved over one more channel to one, it's only gonna be interfering on one channel, which I, I can tolerate one channel. Screwing with two? That's bad. And if you recognize, if you see your SSID on here, and because you're running a hotspot, please turn it off. Do, do, do the entire conference some good. Don't be, don't be selfish. <laughs> Any questions so far? All right. Um, BizOp and... 
Yeah, more than likely what I suspect is actually what I'm just about to talk about is the difference between channel sizes. Um, okay, so um, I'll skip the bullet. Uh, 20 versus 40 megahertz. Um, most devices in 2.4 can only um, connect on 20 megahertz. So that means it uses 20 megahertz of spectrum to speak back to the AP. Um, and then there's 40 megahertz, um, same thing. The, the more megahertz, the more theoretical bandwidth you can shove in that pipe. Um, newer devices, some of them do support 40 megahertz on 2.4 gigahertz. However, when you use a 40 megahertz channel, your channel size is double that of the original spec. So instead of taking, instead of overlap, when you use 40 megahertz channels, there's only two non-overlapping channels. I think they're, I think it's like three and nine. Um, so you lose number of channels, but you can gain performance. Um, the next is the five gigahertz and DFS. Um, DFS, if you do not abide by this rule, you can end up in serious trouble with the FCC. Um, DFS is a mechanism for radar detection. Um, the Doppler radar running at um, the Charlotte Airport here is using five gigahertz to detect what's known as wind shear. It's basically um, turbulence at low level near the ground. And this, this Doppler radar can map that interference to give pilots a heads up of when they're landing. Um, if you run your equipment illegally, meaning you, you hack the firmware, you use non-standard firmware, and you run it illegally, you can interfere with this radar. And the FCC is very sensitive about this radar. There was a WISP down in Florida that ran their radios illegally. They got a $100,000 fine because they were running their uh, equipment illegally. And they and um, they nearly caused an aircraft to c crash because th the pilot could not get accurate data for their wind shear. Um, so you have to know where, the, if you're gonna be running five gigahertz outdoors, you have to know where these radars are listed. Um, Charlotte is the closest one. Um, that Charlotte and Atlanta are the ones I know. And um, anything within 70 miles um, can be affected by this. Um, Basically what happens is if the radio detects, um, if, the, if the radio detects this radar, it shuts down for 10 minutes and listens. If it detects it again, it, it has one of two options. Shut down until, until you physically reboot the device or pick a new frequency from a pre-populated list. Um, the UAPs that we use for this conference are all made by Ubiquiti. Um, the, the product line is called Unify, and this particular product is Unify AC. And I can actually show you one right here. This is, a, this is the production AC. Um, we actually run five of these for the three ballrooms. Um, they, have, they, have two, they have two gigabit ethernet adapters on them. Um, they run in 2.4. They run in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Um, they are PoE compliant, um, AF and specifically, um, and they cost 300 bucks. Now, you could think that's kind of expensive. When you talk about an AP of this caliper, that is not. Um, a Cisco wireless AC AP, you could be looking at 1500 minimum. Um, now we get to the um, UAP. Um, this is. This is their first entry into the client radio, the indoor radio. Yes? The UAP is um, Unify Access Point. Um, Unify is the brand name for Ubiquity. Um, this is 2.4 gigahertz only, and it retails for 70 bucks. But um, all of Ubiquity's radios are PoE only, power over ethernet. So there is no wall, there's no wall adapter. What it is is a PoE injector, which then you run ethernet to the access point. So it's one cable you run to the access point. Um, this happens to use a proprietary um, ethernet, a, a proprietary 
a power injector. Um, the software. This is the software that you have to use to manage the access points. The access points do not have a web interface, um, so you, uh, but they do have SSH. They run BusyBox. Um, so you can't SSH into them, but your options are severely limited if you do that, um, to try to configure the access point using SSH. Um, it is free. It is not open source. It is Java-based. Don't, don't hold that against me. Um, and it is, it, is on, it is needed to configure, control, statistics, and captive portal. Um, all all y'all know what captive portal is? Um, all right, hold on. Yes, exactly. I, um, I'll repeat that. Uh, captive portal is when you connect to the public network and you see that a, a terms and conditions page, but it basically it says I have full rights to kick you off the network. Um, and there's a little connect button at the bottom. Um, and until you hit that connect button, you, do, you cannot pass any traffic past the access point. Um, as soon as you hit that connect button, then you are fully on the network. That is Captive Portal. So when you're configuring, you get the message and your graphics and all of that, and the AP itself, you know, handles so many things the Yes. Um, by default, it ships with a pre, pretty much a generic Captive Portal. Um, all the Captive Portal really is, is about six lines of um, post and get requests. So you can copy those and put them on any HTML page that you want. Ours happens to use HTML and CSS. Um, and actually, I'm going to show you the software. Can everyone see that, or do I need to zoom in? All right, let me see. Uh, that's, uh, I go much more, I'm not going to be able to navigate. So this is the A software um, itself. Um, Here's a little statistics, which it shows up better on when you actually have proper real estate. Um, so this basically just shows a nice, pretty graph for distribution of clients as far as which APs are on, um, how many clients, how much traffic load, and also what um, SSID they're connected on. Um, this is just a summary of all the access points. Um, how many clients are connected, what's their names, over here, again. Um, a summary of their config, so you can see the power levels that I'm running, what frequency they're running, um, what network, um, and even the performance. Um, I don't know what the colors mean, so I don't know. Um, so you can see the distribution of clients, and actually, that top one, I'm really surprised of how many five gigahertz that is. Um, and then you can also see all the users. And bonus, if you can spot your own um, host name. Um, here's some of the users that are connected. From here, you can see the signal strength, how much data they've transmitted. Um, wireless AC, um, the purple means 5 gigahertz. And then the number inside is the frequency. The blue is 2.4. Um, and then also with the guest network in particular, you can block. So if there's a, if one of your users is, is playing some funny business on the network, you can block them from the network and that actually blocks it at the access point level. Yes? It does it by MAC address. And yes, there are ways to get around that, but your average user does not know that. Yes? I do not know. Question them back. All right. Um, also, one of the main things I like about this is it's central control. Um, I can make all my settings done right here. Um, so I can define all my networks, um, including the VLAN, the type of network, the type of um, security. Um, I can also do um, speed limiting by um, client device. So these are done in, it's called groups, user groups, which um, the user groups are based on which um, SSID that they're connected to. Um, so you can see that the speeds that I have set as the maximum 
speeds for up and down are for the different networks. And this is done, again, on the AP level. You can do four SSIDs, um, and they can all be, they can um, be individually VLAN, um, or you can just leave them all on the native VLAN, which there's not a whole, there's not a huge um, use case for doing that. Not that I know of. Um, one thing that you will notice about the Ubiquity stuff is it's not as, um, it's not as high end as you would find on like a Cisco wireless controller. It's free and it's cheap hardware. So you kind of get what you pay for, but it's for the money, it's good. All right. um, for, you, for your question earlier, um, how do you actually get an access point to join the controller? Um, there are two options that I use. There is the host name. So when the access point boots up on the network, it goes out, asks the DHCP server for an address, gets it back, and then does a lookup. It looks for unify dot the domain get from DHCP. So if, like in our, in, in this case, we have self.local. So our unify server is unify.self.local. So these APs out of the box default, I, pl I plug them in and they immediately connect with the server. This also works if they get defaulted somehow, they automatically connect back to the server. Once they are at the server level, um, it, they register it as pending. And then you go in there and you hit adopt. Once it adopts, the, um, it sends a command back to the access point and gives it basically the configs to use and tells it to reboot. Um, the other option is if you can't control the DNS, you can do DHCP option um, 43. Um, I don't know exactly what that option is. I see a lot of Cisco devices using it too. Um, so um, it, the Ubiquity, Ubiquity does make some routers. Um, inside the router interface, it's got a little um, checkbox. We check it and then type in the IP of your Unify server. Um, so does that answer your question about the? So, so the, by default, the Unify access point is going to look for a hosting unify.self? No, it looks for unify dot the domain it got from DHCP. Yes. Yep. And that's that, just there's a simple A record. And how does it what, what is it using uh, is it using TCP? It is TCP. Um, what it actually does is um, I believe it does a modified SSH um, protocol to for the client for the AP to speak back to the controller and vice versa. And it will establish a persistent connection to the server so that it can get away with NAT. Um, all the, this does work over the internet, and we have we got about a dozen of our a dozen sites that connect back to our controller over the, the wider public internet. Um, how to get better performance in um, Wi-Fi? Um, it's channel plan. That's that's one of the biggest ones, and this is where I was going to introduce Insider. Um, Insider is a great way. It's it's Windows, and they also make an Android client. Um, the Android client's actually pretty good. Um, there is similar tools for Linux. Um, Kismet is the one that comes to my mind, um, though I'm not as well versed in those. So this basically, uh, you can sort by signal level. So here you can see that if I was gonna set up an AP located where my laptop is, I would not want to use channel 11 and I would not want to use channel 1 because by signal level that is the highest channels in use right here. So I would fire it up on 6. Um, when you get to the 5 gigahertz you have a lot more freedom and so channel planning is not as important but it still is important. Um, the biggest mistake people make 
and a multi-access point environment is not adjusting the transmit power. This is probably one of the most critical things you can do. Um, basically, what it is, is your clients can hear too many access points and hear them too strongly. What, once you do that, once you decrease the power levels, they hear it's less noise, um, less interference, and the clients connect to access points in a more predictable manner. Um, we happen to run all of our, at this event, we're running all the access points on the 2.4. We, we run them in low power mode, and then we run the 5 gigahertz in a mix of medium and high. The reason is to do the difference is because the range, the, the, signal, the signal level at range is less on 5 gigahertz than 2.4. So clients, as dumb as they are, I'm talking device clients, not people. Um, <laughs> device clients, <laughs> device clients will connect to the strongest signal, whether it's on 2.4 or not. So you could have a you could have a laptop on five gigahertz. It's running great, and then there's this 2.4 access point that gets fired up. Your client will ditch the nice performing five gigahertz to go over to the 2.4 because it's a few dB better signal. Um, even though the 2.4 frequency can be trashed, it doesn't matter. It just looks at the signal strength. Um, another thing, reason I hate device clients and how stupid they are, is um, understanding, understanding minimum RSSI. Um, RSSI is essentially the ratio between signal and noise. So what that means is when the client connects to the access point, the access point is saying you must have a certain signal level if you want to continue talking to me. Um, th this helps in a highly mobile environment like we are in right now where people get up and move. Um, clients are incredibly sticky to the access point they connect to. They will stay connected to that access point. You could walk by three other access points and it'll still try to maintain connection to that original access point. That's where minimum RSSI comes in. Because as the signal level gets lower, as the device walks to the other end of the room, at some point the access point will kick you off. Go, get out, get out of here, go. go. Um, what that does is that forces the client to reestablish connection. When it reestablishes the connection, it connects to the strongest signal level at that time. In most applications, you can't notice this. However, SSH tunnels and VoIP do not tolerate this disconnect. Um, st streaming video, streaming music, web browsing, email, all do just fine. So for your average user, they probably will not notice it. Unfortunately, y'all have noticed that here at this event as you roam around. Because some of, for some reason, a bunch of Linux geeks like SSH tunnels. Um, the next is to prefer, um, this works best in a corporate environment where the IT mandates certain policies of the network. Um, and that is preferring five gigahertz. Um, I'm gonna show you an example of this is with a wireless, um, this is in, uh, of course, Windows 7, um, using an Intel wireless AC adapter. By the way, this AC adapter is, is $35 on Amazon and Newegg. So if you want AC in your laptop, if, 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 unless you use the fruit, um, if you use a real computer, uh, <laughs> if you use a real computer, which you can actually change hardware parts on, then you can pick up a $35 wireless card and swap it out and have AC performance. And it's starting to become the gold standard for after, aftermarket wireless cards. Uh, so I just wanted to show you the property in Windows. Um, and this is, unfortunately it is specific to the driver and anyone, that is the model of the wireless adapter. It's um, Intel 7260 and it retails for 35 bucks. Yes? Do not know, but I, I suspect it is because everything I've read is Intel's wireless drivers are among the best. Do you need to change Depends. My particular laptop shipped with a 2.4 and 5 
radio already inside it. So the antenna was already designed for that application. However, I have a coworker that I swapped out his. His had 2.4 only, and the five is not as good as mine, but it is still pretty darn good. So that is really a trial and error basis. Um, yes? I just looked it up. Uh, the driver is in all the modern kernels. You may or may not have to download a firmware file and place it in the firmware on your machine and reboot, but other than that, that's it. Beautiful, that is amazing. And this is why I like Intel network adapters. I do not like Broadcom or Realtek. I use Intel drivers whenever I can, or uh, Intel adapters. So here's where um, it is quite literally as easy as a drop down menu. Linux, I do not know. Yes, um, this particular adapter does support WiDi, which is Intel's wireless display technology, and it also gives you a Bluetooth 4.0 for 35 bucks. Um, I really wish I could give away a referral code for Amazon. Um, also, while I'm in here, roaming aggression. Um, this is another feature that if you're in a corporate environment and your users are highly mobile, could come in huge advantage. Basically, this changes the level of stickiness an access point has, or a stickiness the client has to an access point. So this can manipulate how long it stays connected. Um, and I set mine to highest because I want mine to reestablish connection as fast as possible to the strongest signal. Um, Observian. Um, Observian is the network monitoring system that I live and die by at my work. Um, we monitor every device, every network device, every CPE that we deploy at a customer's home, we are monitoring um, using SNMP. So Observian is an SNMP. It uses the freemium model. Um, the paid version is 100 euros a year. Um, this, this software, it will, it, 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 how many of y'all use Nagios? How many of y'all hate Nagios? Check out Observian. It makes it super simple to set up. Literally all you do to add a device to Observian is type in its host name. And then it, it um, then you may or may not have to specify a um, community for SNMP. It does allow you to set up a default. So for my company, we use the same community on every device. So I just simply put in the default that we use. Um, it is, they do release an open source version every six months that is, is basically a tarball of the production code at that moment. So, that, so the last release was, I think, in April. Um, it is a PHP, MySQL, RRD, and cron tab based network monitoring. It's not a daemon. You basically put in a cron job that refers back to a PHP code. Um, so it's from, it's pretty easy to install as long as you follow the instructions to a T. Um, if you do not follow the instructions to a T and you mess up and then you go onto the mailing list, um, Adam, the founder of the project, will, first question, did you follow the instructions to a T? If your answer is anything other than yes, he'll say reinstall. Um, so he, he's, he's incredibly strict because I, I think he just got tired of dealing with, um, it, it follows that um, RTFM policy. Um, it uses SVN to do updates, and they release code often, um, almost every day. Um, I once had a bug, I reported it to him, I got an email back going update. Within 20 minutes of me reporting the bug, I updated and it was fixed. Um, and I was gonna give a quick little show of it. Let's see. One of the things that I use observing for in my network is a network log. Um, and so we can see when network interfaces um, come up and come down, switch between 100 megahertz or 100 meg and a, and a gig. We can see when devices reboot. Um, we can see when a device goes down. Um, how it calculates the reboot is if the up timer or the uptime timer in SNMP, if that gets reset, then it considers a device rebooted. Um, one of the, uh, I'm gonna have to shrink the screen. 
All right, one of the things that I use um, a lot is basically sorting the ports. So this is how I keep, this sits on my network operations desk and this is how I monitor traffic. So this, this particular view right here shows network utilization or network traffic by volume of every port in the network. So after watching this for about a week, you can figure out trends. Um, this also can help so when you're back, when your internet connection gets flooded, you could see this and this. Um, it also has support for applications. So um, here is basically the number of hits. Um, this is, I uh, believe, oh, this is hits. Um, this is the daemon, so this right here um, is running for Apache, so you can see what percent of the time was spent writing, reading, DNS lookups, caching, and this is all pulled through um, a plugin or a script on the Apache server. Questions? How am I doing on time? All right. Yes. No, um, I, I think Squid is useless nowadays um, because of SSL, and especially since Google, Facebook, all the big name, um, bi the big name websites are going to SSL, any, um, SSL everywhere and all the time, basically defeats the point of Squid. Um, I, I ran a Squid server about two years ago, and I was seeing about a 10% hit rate, which is not worth the effort. Um, uh, the particular router, uh, the particular router that I use for this event is actually a Ubiquity router, um, which is um, based on Viata. How, him, how many of y'all heard of Viata before? Good. Um, for those who haven't, it is a it is a router OS that is written on top of Debian, um, and Viata basically strips away the De Debian tab completion and uses its own. So when you hit tab, it shows the um, Viata commands. And um, there was a little controversy with Viata. It was bought by Brocade, and Brocade made it commercial. Um, before they did that, um, there was a project called VYOS that forked the Viata, and Ubiquity has forked that. Um, and they are working to get, um, the VYOS is working with Ubiquity about making sure that they stay compatible with each other. So this is basically a summary of the numbers um, that are used for this event. Um, we have five um, of the 2.4 access points. Um, we have five of the AC access points, which are all the ACs are in the ballrooms. Um, we got three servers. Um, these are three one u servers that happen to be sitting on the shelf, not doing anything at work. Um, two HP switches, which are 48 ports each. I know, completely overkill, but they were sitting on the shelf. Um, and a Ubiquity Edge router. Again, overkill. Uh, this is an eight port router um, with two gigs of RAM. Uh, again, it was sitting on the shelf. It's a, cold spare. it's a cold spare for one of our production routers. So after this event, it's gonna get defaulted and put back in the box. Um, all in total, between the network gear and the internet connection, uh, we came at less than $3,000 in gear. Um, there is no way you would be able to do this event with Cisco gear for less than 10 grand. And any of those that have dealt with internet connections before, um, I gotta give props to the um, Time Warner guy. Um, he told me he'd be here, be, be at the, at the hotel between 1 and 5 p.m. on, on two, last, last Tuesday, I rolled up at uh, 1.15 and he was wrapping up. He said, here's your IPs, I connected, they worked immediately. So, there are some good cable installers. Did he ride away on his unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> that he should have. Um, now, temporary internet connections, this is a dirty little secret in the ISP industry. Temporary internet connections are hugely profitable for the company. We paid six hundred dollars for a, for a five or for a fifty by five cable connection for seven days. Yeah, that we paid more than a year's worth.
for that connection, to have that, the privilege of having it for seven days. Um, now, um, it, after we get through the questions, if, if y'all want to, I can go over about some of the stuff my company is doing in the leftover time um, with long range outdoor wireless. So, yes. I, <laughs> I will open it up to questions about this, about the topic at hand. Yes. Um, the way we did it for this event is we immediately turned everything to low and then tested. And unfortunately, we, can't, we could not push the power levels even lower than we needed to. Um, if you're doing it outside of this event, and basically what you go to is you go in between two access points and you sit down and you look at Insider. And if the signal is, is uh, below 50, so this works, um, works a little counterproductive in signal level, neg 50 is worse than neg 40. Um, so if you have a neg 50 signal, that's great. If you see two neg 50s, that's bad. That means there's too much signal. So you'll turn down the access points a little bit to try to more equal it out. So you'd want something like a neg, in that scenario with the, between two access points, like a neg 60. As close as you can. Now there are some things that will influence. So if you just do it by measurement and then try to look at signal strength, wireless is very finicky because of it can bounce off stuff, it can reflect, it can be blocked by a tree. So just because you measure just because a number of feet you are in the middle doesn't mean you're in the middle of the signal. Yes. It's all, it's all, um, oh, the question was, is what is, it, the basically sum it up is what is an acceptable signal level? It's all relative. It's relative to the noise. The more noise you have, the more signal level you need. Um, to get about three bars of signal in Windows, you need about 20 dB separation between your signal and your noise. So in your, in your example, um, as long as your noise, so he was asking about um, is 60 okay? As long as your eight, as long as your noise is better than 80, so maybe it's in the 90s, then yes, 60 will work. 70 would work if your if your noise is in the 90s. Yes. Yes. Next question. All right. So. Um, my company does a lot of outdoor wireless. Um, we have some incredibly long wireless links. Um, our longest link is 60 miles, um, and it runs between a mountaintop and a building in South Carolina. It's running on five gigahertz, so it's unlicensed, so we don't pay the FCC anything. And it can, it can deliver about 50 megs symmetric. Um, the radios, between the radios and the dishes, we're looking at less than a grand in the equipment to make this link work. Um, now, getting access to that tower is, the other, is another story. Um, big cell phone companies and tower owners, like American Tower, they own like 18,000, 19,000 towers in the, in, South, in the US. They can charge, if, it's, if, if the tower's in an urban area, like a downtown city, e even just like this area of Charlotte, a cell, phone comp or a cell phone company or tower owner could want as much as $2,000 a month for a three-foot section of that tower. Yeah, it's, it can get very expensive. So our secret is um, we trade for tower access. So maybe the tower owner is a radio station. We'll go, hey, we'll give you internet if you let us have access to your tower. Um, the other is work with city governments. City governments own towers. And so um, this is what we do with the city of Pickens. Um, the Pickens, they, uh, um, because they were government, they went to the forestry service, which owned a tower on a mountain. And because we're doing this project for the city, we now had access to this forestry service tower that if we were not working with the city, we would have never had access to. 
because they don't give it, they don't let access to commercial companies unless you work with the city. Um, if you give me a second, I'm actually going to log in um, through the VPN to um, the management system that I use for our outdoor wireless. It, if none of y'all have run OpenVPN Access Server, it is incredibly stupid to mess it up. It comes as a prepackaged virtual machine. You plop out on your server, and you boot it up, and you follow the Wheezy Wig Ed you follow, you follow the Wheezy Editor, um, and it's a self-contained virtual machine that does VPN. We happen to have ours tied into Active Directory. Um, by di when you get it as, in the, as a free model, you get two concurrent users. Um, it is five dollars a user a year for VPN app if you go above two. That is incredibly cheap when you start looking at the commercially supported VPN models. Some of the big ones like Cisco and Juniper can, can charge like five or ten dollars a month per, per concurrent user. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is air control. This is another ubiquity software. And this is a little map of our network. Uh, this is just a small um, section of it. We run um, the, va if you look at the number of users, most of our users are residential users. A lot of our users can't get anything more than DSL. And at that DSL, it's a 1.5 1. 1. Um, 1. meg DSL. That's 1.5 megs down. We can come in there for cheaper than DSL and offer three by three, so symmetric bandwidth with a static IP um, for less than they're paying with DSL. Um, now, we're not price competitive with, with the cable companies because it's impossible to be. Um, but we, we're almost always price competitive with the DSL providers. Um, in this particular network, we have uh, um, 138 radios that we monitor. Um, and this, this basically shows um, this basically shows the location. All the coordinates for these are pre-programmed. Um, unfortunately, they do not have a GPS built in because that costs more money. Um, the client radios themselves cost $69. Yes? What sort of uh, latency do your normal client see from, you know, like these people out in rural areas going from DSL to uh, your uh, five gig system, your five gigahertz system? Um, a lot of cases, our latency to Google's public DNS server 8.8.8.8 is better than the cable company. I have cable at my house because I don't live within our coverage area. Um, my average ping latency to Google's DNS server is about 30 milliseconds. From one of our wireless customers, we can expect about, about 5 to 8 milliseconds to Google's DNS servers. Wireless adds between 1 and 3 milliseconds to the link. That answer your question? So th this is um, another view that basically shows the diagram of, so the other one was the physical layout, this is the logical. And all of this is automatically recalculated every time we add a new radio. Yes, it is proprietary, it only works with their radios, but it works good. Um, so. The different colors, red means that link is down, um, blue means it's a good signal strength, and the green means a decent signal strength. And if you come up here, the orange, like you see, um, uh, let me move it. see how this one is orange? That means the signal is marginal. Um, unfortunately, in the outdoor environment, five gigahertz is affected by trees. Um, some of our clients are so desperate to get internet because their only option is 1.5 meg DSL, HughesNet with data caps and, late, and um, ping latencies of five to 600 milliseconds, or dial-up. So we had one client that we went out to their house and they had a row of Leland Cypress pine trees planted at the edge of their property between our mountain and or the mountain that we're on and their home. We said, come back when those trees are gone, or we'll come back when those trees are gone. A week later, we got a call, we went out, and they had cut a 40-foot swath of trees to get our service. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, that customer has been a lawyer customer now for five years. Um, so, what, so where are you mounting your, your, your 
We mount all of our, all of our equipment outdoors um, on, the, on the exterior of the house, um, as high on the house as we can get them. Um, we do on chimneys, on gutters, on um, edges of roofs. So they're, they're legal in cypresses or they're tall enough to obstruct it from mounting it on the roof? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they were mature. They, they were mature trees. Um, the other is um, the thing, because we're a small company, we have flexibility. We have several of our customers that their house is a, there's a tree in the way between the mountain and, and the, um, their house, and they don't want to cut the tree. What they do is they put a post out in their yard, which could be 200 feet away from the house, and that particular spot of the yard has great coverage. So we'll go out and mount the antenna and run the cable back to the house. Now, we leave it up to the customer to bury the cable. Um, that's part because we, we, don't, we don't have equipment to do that, and that's part of the agreement up front. Um, but we'll happily install the antenna wherever, wherever the client wants it. Um, Ethernet. Um, so the customer would simply, um, it comes out of the PoE adapter. So it's, it's Ethernet from the radio to the PoE adapter, and then from the PoE adapter, it's just a simple patch cord to their router. Um, at which point, um, they'll get a DHCP um, address from our router, which is running a static IP. Um, 10-100. No, uh, the, <laughs> there are there are other companies that do this. Um, I I don't know about the Virginia area. There's a couple websites that um, I'll give you my business card. Okay, okay. So you've talked to someone. Um, Any uh, what's one thing very unique about Western North Carolina, like Asheville area, is there's like 20 WISPs running wireless ISPs running in the Asheville, Air, Asheville and Western North Carolina. Where we are, we're fortunate that we're the only ones. Um, so we get almost exclusive use of the frequency. Um, so from the, from this interface, uh, yes, we name our customer, we name our APs after the customer's names. So please don't do anything negative to them. Um, let's see. So one thing from here is See if it's going to work. Is with the click of a button, I can go straight into the client's radio, um, and yes, this is firewalled on. Um, and see, this is the interface for the client the, for the backhaul radio. Um, the client cannot connect to this radio. This is this is exclusively we have exclusive control of this radio. Um, so you can see that the, you know. From here, you can see the signal strength, um, the frequencies, the status. So one of the biggest complaints is we get a customer who calls in, well, hey, my internet's not working. We come down to this box right here, um, which basically says the LAN status, and we'll find it says unplugged. What they did is they unplugged their router from our modem. And so we plug it back in, and we'll see it turn around. It, we see it goes to 100 full. Um, one thing that we do is we run our radios it's it's router mode, so they actually have a static IP on, on the radio itself, and then we do NAT. Um, to get around the double NAT problem, which breaks Xbox 360, is we run DMZ. So we, we set up a DHCP lease with one address, in this case, uh, 192.168.50.2. We then set up the DMZ to point to that address. What that does is, is that enables UPnP from the, clients, from the client's devices, like an Xbox, to speak to the client's radio to open up a port, and then it's like they're on the internet with a public IP, but when really they're not. Um, and um, let me show you some, I don't have, I actually have some pictures of these. Um, actually, wait, maybe I do. So th this is actually some of our installs. Um, um, this is actually the one we did at an airport. Um, that is our radio installed using a satellite mounting um, on a telephone pole. Um, 
Here is on one of our towers looking from behind the antennas. And if you look right here, this is um, GSP International Airport in Greer, um, Greenville Spartanburg Airport. Um, this is the nano bridge. This, this radio right here will do about five miles. And it's, it's, um, the radio itself is like 95 bucks. Um, this guy right here is, it's a 34 dB uh, dish. It's a directional dish. It's four feet wide and can do 60 plus miles. Yes? And, and also, we do not use, um, each client does not get a, um, each client does not get a dedicated point-to-point -point link. We use what's known as sectorials. This happens to be a back of one of our sectorials. A sectorial is a directional antenna, in our case, 120 degrees, which a client then connects to. Um, and this is one of our most creative installs. This, we did an outdoor Wi-Fi, and we installed it to look like that because we didn't want people stealing our radio. So it looks like part of the building. Um, and this is actually in downtown Greenville. Um, and which, which cross streets that? <laughs> <laughs> Not telling you. Um, this is actually um, looking at the building where the sectorial was. Yes. Did you take this picture personally? Yes, yes I did. And I did I did a lot of these installs with the help of my coworker. Um, <laughs> Just a point to point. Uh, where? Between two houses. What, what, what geographic location? Centerville and downtown Greenville. Uh, downtown Greenville? That's. Not, not specifically downtown, but near the. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, here's another one that we did. This is actually um, for the, an install that we did for the city of Pickens. This is, not, this is an outdoor on a light post. Um, we told the city to provide us power. So they mounted this box right here that has a power outlet that we put our injectors. Um, this radio right here uh, receives the signal from the uh, sectorial and then the clients connect on this radio right here. So there is no wires running past this box right here. Um, let's see. Uh, th then that loops the pictures. Any final questions? I'm almost out of time. Yes? <laughs> it's a long story. Um, we're trying, but Aaron is being a pain in the ass. Um, Aaron is the people who assign IP addresses in North America. Um, we're having some paperwork issues with them. Yes, Joel? Uh, what, what's your longest residential length? Um, we have one that is eight miles um, coming off of our sectorial. Um, that client needed internet so bad that they installed a three-foot dish on their roof. <laughs> Final questions? Yes? What was that? Um, that client was only paying for five by five. Um, and and um, we have three, three tiers, uh, three by three, five by five, and ten by ten. If you want more speed than that and you live, and you live in the upstate, give me a call and we can make a custom quote. Um, we can do about 50, 50 by 50 on unlicensed. Um, but Ubiquity does make an unlicensed radio running in 24 gigahertz that can do 700 meg symmetric at less than six miles. And it, wow. and it's, it, it gets better, $3,000 for the two radios. Yes. So $3,000 will get you 700 megs symmetric at less than six miles. All right, well, that's my presentation. Thank you for coming.
customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.